I am Dr. Philip McMillan, and today I am doing a very important call to my listeners, to my subscribers, to the community who is already aware of what has been happening and the implications of what could happen next. It's important to note that when I speak about these things, the truth is that it has very limited reach. For many who have observed many of my videos, my posts, certainly in mainstream media, have been over 90% suppressed. We would hope that in time that would change. However, it's not my platforms, and so I don't have control. The point is, though, you who are listening to this have a responsibility to try and educate your public and critically, your clinical community, wherever you are in the world, this is a very, very important point. In the past day or two, the White House in the USA has published a document with regards to, or a website with regards to the origins of COVID, apologies about what had happened, and I can't specify what the political intentions are, but it is a window of opportunity to help to clarify what may be happening. As I said, Donald Trump has specific views about what has happened in the pandemic and the implications when he was in power. And therefore, he is looking at the true origins of COVID and they are clearly positioning it as a lab leak. And that's understandable, as I said, because of the politics. For me, who has looked at it for a long period of time, listening to experts where there is no clear origin, it was in close vicinity to a lab that was working on coronaviruses, from an objective point of view, without any other clear answers, a lab leak makes perfect sense. But this is not about the politics. This is now about how do you, who are aware of the implications, educate the clinical community that you are in contact with to start thinking about this differently? That's essentially the point that I'm trying to see if I can do here. So let's start with some basic premises. The clinical context has changed. As we said, the USA government, as well as international bodies, have acknowledged the potential laboratory origin of COVID. And the more evidence that is coming out suggests that there are very complex immune and vascular impacts. And we can understand this when we think about how the virus causes clots, microclotting in the lungs, clots in the, in the legs, clots in the brain, clots in the heart. All of these pathological features are unusual and we have known about them for a while. So a lab leak clearly brings into question that the virus can have unanticipated impacts. And anyone who has been following imbalanced clots understands what I'm talking about. As a result, clinical evaluation must now account for post-viral as well as spike protein-mediated immune dysregulation. Without this kind of understanding, your clinical community is blind. They don't know what is happening. And this is now where the responsibility lies to try and understand what does it mean for your patient? And what does it mean in the personal context for your loved one? As I know, many of my cohort who listen very often are in the unvaccinated cohort, but that's the smallest group. There's no point in gloating all the time about the fact that you avoided it. You now need to become an advocate for those people who didn't those people who trusted what they were being told and don't want to face those consequences of reflecting on it. That's a cognitive dissonance. And it's very, very normal. 
the point is is that the general public can have that but not the clinical community that's where the education has to be so when you think about it from the patient's rights every patient now has the right to a comprehensive evaluation based on the most current scientific thinking part of the problem is is that there is very limited information out there for clinicians to start thinking about this differently because most of the content has been suppressed or classed as misinformation the point is now that by positioning this as being something that is no longer just a thought but is becoming a patient right and ethical responsibility that's where we have a chance to change the direction any unusual or persistent symptoms should be carefully documented and investigated not dismissed and it's very important to have informed consent and transparent communication especially where there is uncertainty you have to remember that for those who understand things like the embalmers clots these have been being observed since late 2020 and certainly increased after 2021 that fits in the unusual clotting mechanisms that are being noticed since the pandemic there's a responsibility for every doctor to be aware of it whatever their personal views they need to be aware they need to understand and they need to know if there is any clinical relevance that's the point this is no longer about just what people think this is now about where does the responsibility lie that's the point because doctors are ethically obligated to remain open-minded in terms of diagnosis they have to be updated on clinical practices as new information emerges and they have to prioritize the patient's best interest over their own personal or even their regulatory body narratives and they have to be clinically thorough no bias no assumptions you have to educate clinicians that that's what is so because if you don't tell them if they don't think someone is watching out for this then there is oftentimes no reason to go forward you have to remember that for much of the clinical community there is a similar clinical dissonance because you have had mandates put on the majority of the clinical community doctors nurses healthcare staff who wants to think about that if it has direct relevance to them whenever i speak to people personally one-on-one -on -one, and we're talking anything about this and we talk about what could be the implications the first response is always you can see their eyes drifting away as they reflect on well what does it mean for me what does it mean for my family and i have to quickly remind clinicians that our responsibility is to the patients we don't have the luxury of clinical dissonance or cognitive dissonance there is still the responsibility to understand disease and to try and figure out how to mitigate the impacts so what should you request when you are either going with a loved one or advocating on their behalf make sure that you call for full and respectful clinical consideration of their symptoms it's very easy at the moment for patients to get discounted and one of the diagnoses that will be increasing quite rapidly are functional diagnoses where it's not a real organic problem but you perceive that you're unwell but you're not I've seen patients cry on this point. And they're saying that, no, I've never been sick before. This, I can't explain these symptoms, but I'm not right. And the doctor is saying, we can't find anything wrong. It must be in your head. That approach no longer works in the context of a lab origin virus. 
because we are likely to be seeing clinical presentation that we have never seen before. So instead, clinicians must just document it, discuss it, reflect on it, to try and understand the true implications. As I said, that documentation, the reasoning, putting it in the medical notes, that's what you ask them for, whatever their view. They have to be open to emerging models with regards to COVID-19 and spike protein effects. The reality is that people don't want to think about the spike protein. They will accept almost everything else with the virus. They will accept that the virus was lab made and they will accept that the virus could therefore cause unusual things. But if you position that the spike protein of the virus is the primary reason for these unusual patterns, there is then immediate cognitive dissonance. And the reason is simple, that spike protein was replicated. I recently made a comment about this that got censored. To me, it's an obvious question. If I said the membrane protein or the envelope protein or the nucleocapsid protein, everything would be okay because then it's just about infection. But if you position anything else, especially in relation to the spike protein, there is an immediate step back. And so in some senses, you have to be strategic. Don't worry too much about the other sources of spike protein, but just keep hammering home about the infection. People may be more open to thinking and reflecting on what that means. Always ask for specialist input if there is uncertainty. And hope and push for a collaborative approach that is focused on the patient's health and dignity. The reality is that at this point, patients are unlikely to advocate for themselves because they have cognitive dissonance. Clinicians are unlikely to advocate for the patients because they also have cognitive dissonance. Nobody wants to reflect on the implications of a lab leak, but as I said before, I recently spoke with someone in the police force and their natural instinct has to be suspicious. And they have to look carefully at everything to try and find the answer. Imagine being in a murder investigation and that the person who is most likely to be the primary suspect is someone that you look up to or someone that you can't believe that it is so. There is still a responsibility to look at the evidence, the fingerprints, the DNA, everything that points to the source, no matter what that individual's personal bias is. It's a similar thing in the clinical community. It is time to become how we normally are, a bit suspicious. We look and try and find the worst outcomes because if we can prevent the worst outcomes, we can protect the patients. The aim is not necessarily to be always right, but to make sure that we don't miss the big things. So from a clinical context, the point that has to get across to your uh, clinicians, because it's relevant to you and your loved ones, is that they must be looking out for spike protein abnormalities, unusual disease presentations. And that's how you can advocate, not only for yourself, but for the loved ones who are wandering around with no understanding as to what's going on. I'll have some more details about what you can say to your doctor in the Substack at the end of this. Make sure you come and listen to it because this is very, very important. And I'm clearly putting the responsibility right in your hands. Thank you.